today is 172 Friday group meeting. The speaker is our Pratinder Chimaji, a prominent environmental and other area specialist in this and also known as a JAY. And uh, sir addressed our Friday group on 130th Friday group meeting, that is on 25th October 2019. The topic was group of companies, doctrine, flora, control and after. That was a very interesting topic. It is already video is available. So today's topic is the law of climate change and its legal implications. Particularly after seeing this earthquake and other thing and uh, New Zealand's uh, sudden disaster, I mean, I think very relevant to right click chosen. Chimaji, ours is a uh, one hour total, 45 minutes after the topic, plus minus, 15 minutes question answers. <coughs> so now we have more than 10 lakhs 75 I know, I have a I'm on your view. Viewers, we have. Uh, and, uh, Wonderful. 122 videos. Congratulations to you and uh, your entire team. Now you can initiate, sir. Sure, sure. So, sir. I'll be just now with you. Now, you can be, please, uh, uh, one minute. You can tell yourself, sir. One second. One second. One second. One second. Yeah, you are right. So, I am um, in my 30th year of practice of law. Um, uh, I actually started uh, my pupilage with Mr. Jeet Malani when I started my legal practice uh, many, many years ago. Uh, thereafter, uh, uh, I went overseas to do my master's. I qualified as a barrister and uh, practiced overseas for a number of years. Um, came back uh, till very recently. Uh, I was with uh, Amar Chand Mangal Das as a partner uh, and now I have my own practice. Uh, the focus of my practice is energy law, uh, infrastructure law and uh, climate change law. Uh, that's the focus of my practice and I'm very happy to be here this afternoon uh, at the invitation of Mr. Rao who is very kind. In 2019 he and his team had invited me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here again today uh, on a very, very topical subject uh, which is uh, going to be uh, future. It's also futuristic. I chose the subject also for young lawyers, but this is a very, very futuristic subject. Uh, and let me not confuse this at the outset. Uh, most people think climate change law is environmental law. Uh, it's, it's slightly divergent from that. Um, it may have elements of environment law, but uh, I think what we are going to, what I'm going to share with you, uh, is something uh, much more expansive than what we have typically known in our jurisdiction as environment law. Uh, so, as you, as Mr. Rao has rightly pointed out, um, you know, we are seeing uh, in typically climate change when we talk in common parlance today, um, it's about you know, the floods that are happening, you know, ra rapidity of floods, the forest fires, the rising temperatures. It is in that context in our daily life that we talk about climate change. Okay. Uh, but it has a definition today, a definition which has been adopted by India and globally as well uh, through the UNFCC uh, Convention of Rio de Janeiro of 1992. Uh, and it is a defined term as per that and, uh, and forms part of that convention to which India is also a signatory. Okay. Uh, actually, climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures uh, and weather patterns. That's what essentially, if I don't go through the uh, you know, actual definition, that's what in, in sort of simple plain words one could explain uh, what is uh, climate change. What I would do through this 45 minutes presentation is essentially take you through a bit of a history of how it has come about now, where are we now in terms of uh, global law uh, on climate change, uh, how it is going to affect lawyers like you and me futuristically. Uh, what is going to be the future of litigation in this space, uh, in, in this jurisdiction. Uh, we already, uh, there are some, there was a recent survey. Uh, globally, there are some 2400 lawsuits 
currently pending all over the world on the subject of climate change. Okay. This may be surprising, 11 of them are in India. Uh, and and I am going to then take you over one very important judgment of the Supreme Court of United Kingdom, which I think sets the context of uh, how this litigation is going to pan out in the future. Um, then I will come back to one recent judgment of the our own Supreme Court, uh, where uh, some of the doctrines that have been opined I thought it will be relevant in the context of today's audience that whatever the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom is saying, I think our courts are already seized of that. Uh, those principles are already uh, being discussed and opined upon uh, by this honorable court. Um, so I will not take much time since time is limited. Uh, let me just go over what has happened over the last sort of, I would say, 40, 50 years. So the first, so the subject may be very hot since last 10 years, but the first conference uh, of the United Nations happened in the year 1972 uh, on the subject of, uh, it was called the first United Nations Conference on Environment. It did not result in any treaties or any kind of conventions signed by attendees to that conference. Uh, 1992 is the year when the Earth Summit happened in Rio de Janeiro. And that's when the United Nations uh, uh, Convention was first time signed, to which India also became a signatory, uh, on subject of climate change. Okay. And, I, and every year thereafter, you must be reading in newspapers about COP26, COP27, uh, COP28 is going to happen this year. Uh, what is it? So since the Rio conference, there have been an annual conference <coughs> of the parties who are signatories to this to, signatory to this convention, uh, which happens in various parts of the world. Uh, I will only allude to the important ones uh, because each one does its own work in terms of progressing uh, as far as this law is concerned. But I would only allude to the important ones as far as this convention is concerned. So this, this, was, this was 1992. Uh, then uh, from 1995 onwards, uh, these COP meetings started happening on an annual basis with convention countries, parties. Normally it's the big jamboree. If you really ask Glasgow summit, there were 40,000 people who attended that event, apart from people from the government, administrators and others. I think 1997 was an important year after 1992 because that's when the Kyoto Protocol, to which also in India is signatory, was signed. And what is this? Uh, what does Kyoto Protocol say? The Kyoto Protocol talks about cutting emissions to 5.2% uh, below 1990 levels by 2012. Okay, so this was the promise which member countries at that point of time had made. Uh, as part of the signatories to the Rio conference, okay, and the UNFCC convention. Uh, so that was 1997. Thereafter, in 2007, uh, there was a Bali action plan. So I'm just jumping few years because I think I'm only alluding to the relevant ones. Uh, and this, there were guidelines. Uh, so the Kyoto Protocol was up till 2012, it had to be. So it had to be extended. So in 2007, it made that extension of the Kyoto Protocol that these cutting down of emissions should happen over the future, future time, meeting with the goals that they had already set following several conventions that had happened thereafter. So 2007 was the Bali Convention, which was important. Then came the Copenhagen Convention of 2009, and this talks about actually the treaty to be, uh, see, so far it was only a convention, so they there was no binding sort of uh, treaty on parties. So they started at that, that point of time talking about a treaty which finally culminated in 2015 uh, in the Paris Agreement. Okay, So I'm just alluding to these four important meetings that happened before the 2015 COP21 when it happened uh, and we signed the Paris Agreement to which uh, we are also signatory and it's a binding law uh, on our country. 
uh, it also is binding on some very, very influential and powerful countries which keeps going in and out of that convention uh, according to the change of government. As you all know, uh, that country, which is the United States of America, um, if you remember, Mr. Trump, uh, when he assumed presidency, he wanted to step out of the Paris Convention. And then when Mr. Biden took over, President Biden took over, he has stepped back into uh, respecting the treaty that they had signed. So what did, uh, so there was an agree, uh, 2019, 2009 Copenhagen, then there was uh, 2011 Durban conference, which talked about reaching a legal accord by 2015 uh, to cut global emissions. And then 2014 Lima conference, uh, which was a preparatory meeting leading up to the 2015 convention treaty, actually, which we signed. Uh, and what did the Paris Climate Conference do? It's, it came with a universal agreement to cut emissions sufficiently to prevent Earth's <coughs> temperatures rising not more than two degrees okay, um, to the pre-industrial levels. Uh, 147 world leaders took part in this conference and there were some 40,000 40, people including government and NGOs and civil society. Uh, so this is what is a framework today for us in India as well as globally, uh, which sort of is governing law in terms of international climate change. I will skip this slide because I think this is uh, the achievement talks about achievements, but I think one of the things that started happening after the 2015 convention, which is relevant for our discussion today, is uh, the NDCs. What are NDCs? NDCs are nationally determined contributions. Okay. Now, in, the, in a nutshell, uh, let me explain what that concept is. That since each country will voluntarily uh, determine its own um, contribution in cutting emissions uh, and net zero emission levels to be achieved, that contribution is what is provided for nationally by each country. And India uh, also has, if you remember last year, has also set that goal to 2070, uh, whereas the world goal though is 2050, uh, but it has net zero commitment in 2017, which has which has been pronounced now. Okay, so this is what essentially what is what is the nationally determined contributions mean? Uh, we voluntarily every year uh, submit what will be our contribution, and therefore the secretariat then accumulates that what all commitments have come through, uh, they will be met. Uh, by the member country according voluntarily what they have announced. Okay. There are several litigations, I would say, and several notices under the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol to member countries. Um, so I am bringing the law element to this. So this is not just pure convention. This is how the law comes into play here. So there is now several uh, uh, there is a secretariat which looks at if you made a contribution, nationally determined contribution, are you actually meeting those contributions or not uh, in, in pursuant to the Kyoto Protocol. So there are a number of litigations there that are happening. Uh, I think I could spend an entire evening talking about it, uh, but I'll move on because I think there is an important judgment that I would like to share with you. So getting on with our own sort of um, uh, India's uh, uh, climate change uh, law, India's uh, climate change commitment, and what is India's NDC. So there is today an Indian network of climate change assessment, uh, which is established by the government of India. Uh, there is also a national action plan on climate change. Um, obviously, national hydrogen mission uh, has been announced um, last year, if you remember, uh, in the budget just before, around the budget time, the Prime Minister had announced the National Hydrogen Mission. Um, I had some contribution in terms of determining the legal framework for that mission. Uh, so that was my small contribution to that announcement that was announced. Uh, and so what are India's NDCs? So now what they have said is, um, I'll just quickly read this to you. It says, 
that achieve about 50% accumulative electric power install capacity from non-fossil non fuel based energy resources by 2030. Whereas our first commitment was cumulative electric power install capacity from non-fossil sources to reach 40%. Uh, that was in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed. But today, in, on 2022, we are saying that we will re reduce this by 50% by 2030. <coughs> then, the second commitment that we have made last year uh, at the Glasgow Summit is reduce emissions intensity uh, by 45% by 2030 from 2005 level. The third important commitment that we have made is propagate a healthy and sustainable way of living based on traditions and values of conservation and moderation including through mass movement for life, lifestyle for environment as key to combat climate change. So this is more like a citizen-centric approach to climate change. So I think these are commitments, one of the important commitments that uh, our Prime Minister at the Glasgow Summit has made and, uh, and it is binding on us uh, insofar as, uh, insofar as uh, India's commitment is concerned. So, what are the legal implications since the topic is the law of climate change and the legal implications so let's step into this is to just give you a background of what has happened so far but let's now step into what are the legal implications for this and how it's going to affect you and me as professionals uh, how is it going to affect uh, our environment how is it going to affect our families how is it going to affect our society uh, generally so while there is policy pressure there is uh, uh, litigation and liability risk involved in all of this. Um, there is also related disclosure and compliances. If you all, we all are familiar today with a term called ESG, uh, which is already part of a legislation. Uh, these are all part of related disclosures and compliances which are being put in place uh, only to combat <coughs> climate change. Okay, so we already have that process moving within our own sort of jurisdiction. I have already alluded to that the number actually is 2419. These are the number of cases which are happening, litigations that are happening on the subject of climate change globally and India has 11 active litigations in this space right now. Uh, so what are the kind of disputes that are arising vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change? So first are specific to transition, I just told you people Countries have made commitments, uh, NGOs, private parties, tribals, uh, Red Indians, a uh, wide variety of people uh, today litigating uh, in courts uh, based on the commitments that countries have made uh, and they are not achieving those commitments. It could be contract specific as well, uh, where, uh, so coming to, giving you an example, a practical example, an Indian corporate, for example, uh, today Indian corporates are now establishing subsidiaries overseas, uh, they are making operations overseas, Tata's has, Adani's have, Ambani's have, and so have Mahindra's and others who are now global players, even our, uh, you know, Hero Electric and Hero Motors, TVS for that matter. So all these companies are now establishing their subsidiaries overseas. Okay? And they are, uh, they, are, they are putting their operations there uh, and very large operations, not small operations. So therefore, as a result, uh, the case law that I'm just going to discuss, how it will apply to even our corporates okay, uh, when they operate overseas. Just like the case where I'm going to say where a subsidiary in Nigeria owned by Royal Dutch Shell, which is headquartered in UK, um, is, is, was litigated against. Okay. Actions happening in Nigeria, uh, but uh, a court of appeal in United Kingdom determining issues on climate change on that subject. Okay. So I, I, I think, let me move on. Uh, to that case law because I think we are limited on time. So the f uh, for those of you who wish to record it, uh, it's uh, <coughs> Kabi and others versus, versus Royal Dutch Shell. 
It's the 2021 UK Supreme Court judgment, which has just come out about two years back during the COVID period. Uh, I think very, very relevant uh, to the law of climate change. Okay. So, very interestingly, I've, what I've done is, what are the parties, what was the claim, and what was the issue? So, I'll very succinctly refer to that. So, the parties here was, there were two set of proceedings here. There was an Ogale proceeding and a Billy proceeding. I'm just going to read this from here. In the Ogale proceeding, the appellant claimed, okay, now this is a claim against uh, SPDS, which is a subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell in Nigeria, and the Royal Dutch Shell Company in the United Kingdom, headquartered in UK. Okay. Now, in these proceedings, the, the Ogale proceedings, the appellants, the appellants here were Nigerian farming and fishing community. I just referred to you earlier that how people who are not only NGOs or doing public interest litigation, but also civil society, people who are tribals, they are raising such issues globally now. And these are coming to courts. Uh, so they, uh, 40,000 individuals in River State, Nigeria, had made this claim. The claim is brought by the leadership of Ogale community, namely the king, uh, His Royal Highness Emery Goodwin Bibi Okabe, and the Council of Chiefs, suing both for himself and in representative capacity on behalf of people of the Ogale Kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> in belief proceedings, the claimants uh, Appellant claimants are two, three, three, five individuals who live in the Billy Kingdom, a remote riverine community in River State, Nigeria. Now, these are the parties, okay, imagine. And they are, who are they suing? They're suing the subsidiary as well as they're suing the parent in the United Kingdom. Now, where is this claim made? The, the subject matter or the issues are arising at a subsidiary level in Nigeria, but the claim is being made in United Kingdom. Uh, in the courts uh, in the United Kingdom. And what is the claim? The claim says that the numerous oil spills that have occurred through oil pipelines and associated infrastructure operated in the vicinity of the appellant communities, the appellants allege that these oil spills have caused widespread environmental damage, including serious water and ground contamination, and have not been adequately cleaned or remedied. It is said that the result of the spills, the natural water sources and the appellant's communities cannot safely be used for drinking, fishing, agriculture, agriculture purposes, washing or recreational purposes. And what is the issue? Okay, the issue is appellant's case against Royal Dutch Shell is that it owed a common law duty of care because as pleaded, it exercised significant, significant control over material aspect of SPDC. SPDC is a short form of their subsidiary in, in Nigeria. Uh, SPDC's operations and or assumed responsibility for SPDC's, SPDC's operation, including by the promulgation and imposition of mandatory health, safety, environmental policies, standard manuals. I think I'm going to pause here for a minute. It's very interesting. And you will see when, as we go through this judgment. So, you know, as a, a global company, as a global oil company, uh, they had uh, set up their operations rules. They had set up their environmental rules. They had set up a procedure. If a spill happens, how a subsidiary anywhere in the world would deal with it. It's very interesting how that those elements are coming, biting back at this parent. Uh, while they're imposing all these conditions globally on all their subsidiaries across the world. Okay. Uh, very, very interesting case, and here is a small introduction to it. Related to this is another 2019 judgment in the Vedanta matter, okay, which was also decided by the Supreme Court of United Kingdom. Uh, it was titled Langbo versus Vedanta Resources. PLC. Uh, the question before the Supreme Court of United Kingdom was, does the court have jurisdiction? Uh, A, is the RDS, which is the Royal Dutch Shell parent, is it responsible for actions of its subsidiary, which is in another jurisdiction, okay, which is Nigeria? 
so jurisdiction was a question and whether a parent or the acts of the subsidiary which is in another jurisdiction incorporated a separate entity uh, will will the parent also be responsible for the acts of its subsidiary so very interesting uh, <clears throat> that uk domiciled parent does it owe any common law duty of care i think that's the question which was being raised uh, and whether uh, uk courts have sufficient jurisdiction to act on the foreign subsidiary as necessary and proper party to the proceeding i think that was the key uh, part of this case uh, in a nutshell court of appeal actually was divided okay court of appeal dismissed this okay against royal dutch shell and there was one dissenting judgment there uh, one judge dissented in that uh, matter uh, therefore the matter went up to the supreme court of united kingdom okay um and in this in the united kingdom uh, and i'm quoting this from vedanta judgment which was a 2019 supreme court judgment of the united kingdom it talked about the liability of parent company in relation to activities of subsidiary is not of itself a distinct category of liability in common law negligence typically you would not because these are separate as we know the doctrine they are separate legal entities so why how can a parent be made responsible for something and this is also some thousands of miles away from where the parents are situated please tell the conclusion i'm i'm just coming to that sir this depends on the way in which the parent availed itself of the opportunity to take over intervene control supervise or advise so i think that's that's the not sure you know you go ahead okay. please no problem sir please very okay. seriously Fine. Fine. sir also huh? Okay, okay, lot of time. Uh, lot of time, sir. Okay, fine. You can give us the conclusion okay. of the judgment. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to come to that, sir. The appellant's case against Royal Dutch Shell is that it owed a common law duty of care because, as pleaded, it exercised significant control of material aspects of SPDC's operations and/or assumed responsibility for SPDC's operations, including by the promulgation and imposition of mandatory health. safety environmental policies standards and manuals which allegedly failed to protect the appellants against the risk of foreseeable harm arising from spdc's operation it is agreed that issue of governing law should be approached on the basis that the laws of england and wales and law of nigeria are materially the same um, and a similar issue as i said earlier was in vedanta so what did the appellants argue in this case before the supreme court they said both the parent and the subsidiary has common business objectives okay uh, their objective is the same uh, the second that the royal dutch shell actually controls its entire shell group companies all over the world with standardized policies uh, for safe operation of its subsidiaries and facilities and assets it has a manual which is applicable to all its subsidiaries not only in nigeria all over the world the operating standard of the subsidiaries of royal dutch shell across the world is through a manual which is created by the parent company okay the technical practices of extraction of uh, of uh, uh, of management of um, uh, decommissioning so to say of an asset are all standardized by royal dutch shell sitting in london and the health and safety standards and the environmental standards which the company has set internally are also the ones which are imposed by the parent company over a subsidiary so any emergency spills that happen uh, that manual will be pulled out by the subsidiary and they will follow that uh, the rules in that manual okay so that's 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 essentially what was argued uh, before the supreme court by the appellant which is the okape tribe uh, and their lawyers okay uh, <clears throat> and the two issues that court had to determine was whether majority of the court of appeal materially erred in law by rejecting the claim which was made by the okapi community and so if whether the majority was wrong to decide and is there any real issue to be tried coming to sir's view, view as to what is the ratio of this case and i'm just going to read this paragraph 157 158 159 of the judgment i think this is very very crucial 
it says wills formal binding decisions are taken at corporate level these are taken on the basis of prior advice and consent from vertical business on functional lines and organizational authority generally precedes corporate approval wills the respondent suggested that royal dutch shell could only delegate responsibility for its own corporate governance and group wide strategy functions the rds control framework shows that ceo <coughs> and the rds rd uh, royal dutch shells ex ceo have wide range of responsibilities including for the safe condition and environmentally responsible operation of shell facilities and assets globally okay it is appellant's case that shell group's vertical organizational structure means that it is comparable to what lord briggs had said in vedanta example of group businesses which are in management terms carried on as if they were single commercial undertaking with boundaries of legal personality and ownership when the group becoming irrelevant however this organization structure worked in practice and the extent to which the delegated authority of royal dutch shell the ceo and the royal dutch shell ex ceo was involved and exercised in relation to decisions made by spdc are very much in dispute as is apparent from the witness statements it is also an issue in relation to which a proper disclosure is of obvious importance it clearly raises tribal issues for all these reasons the supreme court of united kingdom says i am satisfied that the majority of the court of appeal was wrong and to decide that there was no re real issue to be tried so it assumed jurisdiction to opine on this it it did not reject that argument from royal dutch shell so therefore it becomes one of significance uh, in terms of applying the doctrine of proportionality which is my switching over to the our indian context how that is relevant so they were here applying in conclusions the doctrine of proportionality which is very much part of indian jurisprudence and i thought i'll speak for a few minutes on that how this is applicable how this this judgment because this judgment actually actually is on doctrine of proportionality so what is the test of proportionality this court our own supreme court the Constitu constitution bench uh, has in modern dental college and research center uh, considered this question and has laid the doctrine of proportionality it says while considering a balance between right under article 191g and the reasonable restrictions under clause 6 of 19 article 19 of the constitution of india it observed thus while examining as to whether the impugned provisions of the statute and rules amount to reasonable restriction and are brought out in the interest of general public the exercise that is required to be undertaken is balancing a fundamental right to carry on the occupation on one hand and the restrictions imposed on the other hand this is what is known as doctrine of proportionality jurisprudence has most recently been applied uh, in india in our vivek narayan sharma versus union of india 2023 supreme court uh, cases and there it has talked about the four time four four tests which has it has laid that judgment okay for, taking from chief justice of israel uh supreme court the four tests are is there a proper purpose okay. uh is there a reasonable nexus that's number 2 is there any other alternative okay uh and then third is balancing the proportionality the balancing between the two so i think i think that test was applied similarly by the uk supreme court uh in making that judgment uh in the supreme court of the united kingdom uh, on the royal dutch shell matter versus appellants which were the tribals i think same principles if you see juxt juxtapose that with our jurisprudence we find it all in our rule books as well um if you may allow me i think i just want to just read a very very brief part of the judgment uh our indian judgment which is basically on the uh, demonetization case as you all know famously now it says um, uh, 
let us test the four prong text called out of Erhan Barak, former Chief Justice Supreme Court of Israel, which have been reproduced in the case of Modern Dental College and Research Center. The impugned notification has been issued with an objective to meet the following three concerns. Number one, the fake currency notes of the state banks have largely been in circulation and has found to be difficult to easily identify genuine bank notes from fact notes, fake notes. Uh, it has been found that high denomination bank notes were used for storage of unaccounted wealth which was evident from large cash recoveries made by law enforcement agencies and it has also been found that fake currency is being used for financing subversive activities such as drug trafficking and terrorism causing damage to the economy and the security of the country. And I think the ratio is here. Insofar as reliance on the judgment of the constitution bench of this court in case of K.S. Puttuswamy, which is the Adhar case, uh, is concerned, in the facts of the said case, the constitutional bench found that on account of various measures undertaken by the government to give boost to digital economy, millions of persons who were otherwise poor had opened their bank accounts. They were also becoming habitual to the good practice of entering into transactions through their banks and even by using digital mode for operation of their bank account. The court in this background found that making the requirement of Aadhaar compulsory for all such and other persons in the name of checking money laundering or black money was grossly disproportionate. The observation made therein were in the context of factual background that fell for consideration in the said case. In our view, the said observation would not be applicable to the facts of the present case, which was the demonetization case. And we have considered in detail as to how, upon appl application of the four-prong test of proportionality, the impugned notification cannot be struck down. So I think uh, the reason I just wanted to allude to our Indian jurisprudence, and I have whole cases right from 1987 onwards when this doctrine had been applied in Indian jurisprudence, um, uh, is that how our courts are also sort of using the same doctrine as the UK Supreme Court did. I think I'm going to pause here uh, for anybody to ask any questions on the subject uh, per se. So the test you said in Vivek Nayan Sarman, those four tests were already uh, even in modern dental, huh? uh, just a secret. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. is re-address. Yeah, yeah. See, yes. that see, doctrine itself has been there it's in 1987 yes. judgment. Yes. I think there's a Ranjit Thakkar versus Union of India. If you see yes. 1987 Supreme Court, I think that's the first time, and so far as my research goes, the doctrine has been used yes. uh, in, in in that jurisdiction, in our jurisdiction. I wanted to know this uh, citation for this uh, Vedant resource case. Ah, I'll just tell you, sir. No question, please. Question from you. He's asking for the citation. I'll give you, sir. I'll give you. Just wait one minute. I'll just have it here. Doubts. Maybe you can raise your doubt. It's 2019, UK Supreme Court 20. Sir, doctrine of proportionality is based on administrative law. Basically, on the principles, law should not be used to suit a sparrow. Why it is safe? Only on the basis of the restriction which has been imposed or otherwise reasoning. So I think it's very interesting uh, that you raise that question because when I was reading the UK Supreme Court judgment and looking at the Indian Supreme Court judgment uh, more recently in uh, Adhar as well as uh, our um, demonetization case. See, both of these are statutes which are being stuck down under the constitutional law. But it's very interesting, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom is using the same doctrine for a commercial litigation. There lies the difference. There, there is no constitutional challenge there or any statute being constitutionally challenged before the UK Supreme Court. But they are applying the same doctrine which we typically apply in Indian jurisdiction on constitutional principles or constitutional based litigation is being applied in a commercial litigation overseas. So that, that shows the depth of sort of the growing range where this doctrine is now being utilized. And that has to be tested in these four tests. Yes. Whether it fits into it. Yeah. I mean, each court may have its yes. own tests which they have said. Please. I think UK Supreme Court has its own sort of tests which they have said fairness, fairness reasonableness. Yes. I think 
the words are the same. Maybe caused. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's it's worded differently in different jurisdictions, but I think in essence they mean the same. Yes. You know, reasonableness, fairness. Yes. Um, uh, you know, so, so those are be caused. Yes. And yes. yes. Any other question? Question. Yes, sir. Uh, you have some very good information and really very happy to be with you. Thank so you, basically, sir. sir, we have learned from last 10 years that certain global warming is here. And sir, so many nuclear tests and other weapons are also being things. So is there any reforms have been come into effect about such tests and all other things? Those nuclear reactors and all other things. I am not aware about such things, but sir, being you are very well aware about climatic things, so I feel that good, you must have... Good question, have and let me put it uh, very interesting. Uh, it could lead to a very interesting scenario. The, what you're saying is that a nuclear test which may happen in any jurisdiction which is signatory to the Paris Convention, the Paris Treaty uh, of 2015. Um, and if that breaches the nationally determined goal, you know, so I think from a treaty perspective, uh, the powers to be, the Secretariat is looking at your nationally contribution, national NCDs basically. What is your annual contribution, NDC, sorry. Which, what is your nas nationally determined contribution? Now, it could have multiple factors, okay? And nuclear uh, <coughs> sort of explosion could be one of them. So a group of citizens could actually raise and say, okay, I'm going to go to the court, okay? And say that you are not actually meeting the climate change goals, you're doing all these explosions. So I see a potential of what you're saying as a potential litigation somewhere. It may happen, okay? And uh, I mean, I've, I've read the subject extensively. There are hundreds of cases which are happening in similar vein as to what you're mentioning to me right now. Sanjay, sir. I'm very much interested in the local issues of India. Sure, sir. Joshi Mutt, a series of earthquakes have taken place. Roads and highways have split. Several hundred buildings have collapsed. They are cause of certain things that we have done change <coughs> this climate. So my conclusion is that climate change is man-made, it's not God-made. And earthquakes or heavy rainfalls or very low rainfall or like in Delhi, we have hardly had winter this time. Winter is over today, we are, we are not wearing warm clothes and it's just mid-February. So this is what we want. We were interested, really. Very, inter but, very interesting, sir, what you say. Because we, this climate change issues come from the bottom up. And then it ends at COP 29, this I, year, I didn't want to be definitional, very definitional, but I can actually read the definition of climate change to you now. But Since who, you mentioned who, this. Who made this? No, no, but we... We who suffer no, no, have I, a different allow idea me, of allow me to change. Allow me to say it actually matches with what you're saying. What It complements to what you're saying. Okay, so it's Article 1 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992. It says the climate change has been defined as a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly for to human activity. Exactly. So what you're saying is it complements to what, what you're saying. So I, that's why I wanted to read this. And that alters the composition of global atmosphere which is in addition to natural climate variability observed over a comparable time periods. Okay, so that's exactly what you're saying. It is <coughs> attributable to human activity. So how do we go about this, with all this activity going on in the Himalayas? And earthquakes are happening, not just one or two, series of earthquakes. In Joshimata, not far away in Iran or Iraq, or the so-called Western disturbances. <laughs> it's happening here. And what we have done, we are building uh, power stations, of course. We need all the power. So if you need power, then you go for nuclear power. These are, of course, personal opinions. Then you talked of hydrogen. I am definitely in support of hydrogen fuel rather than battery-operated EVs. Hydrogen fuel is so good, it will just disappear. But who will take care of the used batteries? You have, you, you can't even manage your bathroom waste, kitchen waste. How will you manage this lakhs and lakhs of Leaking batteries. Yes, leaking batteries. So the government has and come out with an announcement. Uh, and the life budget. of a battery is not more than five years. It will leak after five years. Who's talking about it? You see, we have to talk about these things because these lead, as you have read, 
from the definition, these things lead to climate change. So, yeah, so rightly discussed uh, uh, lithium batteries. The technology was the theme in COP27 in Egypt. Lithium was also discussed. So, what is your take on the use of lithium bat batteries in India uh, by going <coughs> by the principle of CBD as a so let me let yeah, me let me tell you, having practiced energy law for over two decades now, I find that sometimes our policy is not consistent. So now that's my general view uh, on um, how we have over a period of time uh, just kept changing our goalposts as to what is the best medium for us in terms of uh, in terms of uh, using um, as a source of energy. Okay. You see, if, till about five, seven years back, uh, everybody was talking about natural gas import. Okay. What has happened after that is, then there was a phase when, I think at least I have been involved in those terminals myself, so there have been LNG terminals which have been set up on both east coast and west coast of India. Okay. Um, who, who's who owns those terminals. Um, so there was a great focus on LNG terminals. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Uh, we have long-term contracts with Qatar and Oman to supply LNG to India. Now there's a great talk about biomass. Okay. Again, being an energy deficient country, anybody can get up and say, okay, we should look at biomass as a source, a natural source, nothing wrong with it. Since last year, I think there's a lot of talk about hydrogen as a source of energy. Okay. In my personal view uh, of somebody who studies the subject and who practices the subject, uh, there needs to be an integrated energy approach. Okay. You can't keep changing nation's goalposts again and again. Okay. We need a comprehensive, like some countries have done that, an integrated energy policy which you should follow through. Now, when you talk about lithium and EV batteries, which Sir was alluding to, it talks about mobility, e-mobility. Okay. I think coming to the brass tacks, simply putting it, it's all about electricity. How do you produce that electricity, right? I think we need to look at the source. Okay. What is the source that is going to generate that piece of power, electricity, or energy, whatever you want, the term you want to use. Therefore, I think it's important that we make one and final choice as to this is what is the best fit for us, for our economy, for the dynamics. So, see, every technology is not cheap. Hydrogen is not a cheap technology. As a matter of fact, to, to convert, I know very the subject very well, to convert hydrogen commercially into vehicles is a very expensive proposition at this stage. Maybe technology may evolve at a later stage and hydrogen may become a fuel of the future for us. But currently, if you want to do it, and there are studies, there are IOC, and there is the, the whole sort of, there are R&D happening with large companies uh, where they're trying to find a commercial solution to how hydrogen can be used as a potential fuel in India. And, you know, just like, EV cars today are more expensive than your uh, fossil fuel cars. Okay, same way, I think hydrogen will also go through a phase. Okay, it will also go through its own transition to becoming a main source of yeah. fuel, uh, and also it requires all kind of uh, clearances from peso, safety standards. All that has to be also in place. Some of it is already in place. You know. Uh, what is the volume in cylinder? What is the pressure in that cylinder that we can keep? Now, one of the most significant and important aspects of hydrogen is that it is highly inflammable. So I think the safety standards have to be really, really good. I think the government is working on it. The PESO is working on it as well. Uh, but I think to, for it to become a mainstream fuel for India, okay, um, I think it's some time. Also, I think there's a great combination between green hydrogen uh, and the RE goals that the government has set. Okay, 500 gigawatts, which they want to set up. 
I think there's a great combination in that because from there will come the fuel for hydrogen, you know. And therefore, I think it's important that, um, and I, this is my, has always been my view that there is a need for integrated energy policy which should be followed uh, and be very helpful as a country for us, you know. Uh, we can't keep changing our goalposts every five years. I think it's quite robust. Uh, I mean, it's quite robust. Uh, um, I think more could be done, uh, but I think uh, currently uh, it's quite centralized, I would say. It's uh, monitored right from the top. So, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't. Any, Correct. Correct. any more questions? Please. Uh, thank you very much, Chima sir. So nicely you explained uh, your lecture, the questions, and group uh, message will go very largely worldwide. I thank think so. Thank you, sir. And, uh, that's thank you for inviting me. Happy to come anytime. Thank you very much, sir. But finally, one word I want to say, sir, in a out of Friday, he looks like our sitting judge, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> As if he's coming and he's giving lecture. That's very kind of you. Uh, I want to ask final one question. How many people, members are impressed uh, uh, with the Chima Sub uh, lecture? <laughs> Thank you very much. But on <laughs> only on jurisdiction. Huh? Impressed on jurisdiction issues, <laughs> not climate change. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not overall. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take your autograph, please, sir.